Computer Science and Engineering Colloquia features accessible talks by leading computer scientists and computer engineers from across the region and around the world. And it's really my pleasure to introduce uh, Andreas Stefik. I call him Andy or Stefik sometimes. Um, he's an assistant professor at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Uh, he's very well known for his empirical work on understanding how people actually program as opposed to the, in quote, you know, theory of programming languages. Um, also, he's the creator of Quorum and Sodbeans. Quorum is a programming language that is suitable for teaching at very low levels. Um, I think it's cooler than Scratch and Alice and all those myself. And uh, he won the 2011 um, Oracle Innovation Award for his work on Quorum and, and Sodbeans. Both of these are accessible to kids who are, are blind and want to program, while everything else is not, uh, all these elementary programming languages. Uh, I'm really excited to announce, by the way, that, that uh, how many people have heard of Hour of Code? Well, there's going to be an Hour of Code starting uh, December 8th. And the announcement of what the projects are for the Hour of Code have been announced. So you can go to the website and look them up. And uh, it's really exciting that one of them is in Quorum. And it's the only one that's accessible to blind children using screen readers. So that's, uh, you know, I just want to give Andy an applause just for that. Now, he's not going to talk about these great achievements uh, today. I should mention one more thing, by the way, that Andy and I work together. We have a proposal, and uh, we have a grant from the National Science Foundation called Access CS10K. And the, the goal of this is to make programming um, and elementary computer science accessible to K through 12. And it just started uh, recently. So we're going to be working a lot more together on that. But his topic today is the programming language wars. And, you know, it's kind of like the Peloponnesian Wars, except safer, maybe. Um, anyway, uh, Andy, tell us about the wars. Uh, thanks. That was um, exceedingly kind coming from you, to say the least. Um, I, don't, I don't know if all those things are great achievements or not, but um, I, I keep busy. So I'll, I'll tell you about the kind of stuff that I'm, that I'm doing, at least. Um, so just by show of hands, how many people have heard this term sort of informally, the programming language wars? Anybody? So um, it's a funny thing, uh, computer science. Um, I think m most people in this room would probably agree, and again, I'll ask for show of hands, how many people think that programming languages probably either have or have had an impact on the world? Right? Probably most of us, right? Now, granted, this is a computer science department, so that's not too surprising we would say that. Uh, but I think it's probably fa safe to say that in the last 50 years or so, science has expanded at a pretty quick pace. And uh, computer scientists are probably at least partially responsible for that, for good or ill. Um, we know now that uh, physicists, biologists, psychologists, and many other kinds of scientists use computation just as part of their daily work. It's not at all unusual for a psychologist to say that they used R or SPSS or something to do very mathematical computations. It's not at all unusual for a bioinformatics specialist to say that they used a particular language to, to analyze some DNA structure. Programming is simply part of science today, right? Um, and what programming languages do at their core is they basically let us tell the computer what we want it to do. Right? I mean, we could say programming languages do many things, but at the end of the day, our goal as humans is to tell the computer what we want it to do. Right? That can be many things. And as computer scientists, we have sort of an, an interesting role, at least I think. Um, and I, I call that the, that we're the stewards of computation. Right? What I sort of mean is that as computer scientists, or especially people that do language design, we have quite a bit of influence on how programming languages are created. In, in fact, in some cases, we have total influence over how programming languages are created. And as such, we impact how computations are performed or how people understand it, et cetera. And so um, this has consequences that are good and bad, right? So when we create new programming languages, which happens all the time, 
it causes communities to grow or shrink, right? If you invent a new language X and it supplants Y, by definition, over time, those communities tend to diminish or grow, right? That's objective, right? Um, when we make alterations to programming languages, it has impact on the world. And this is not just um, usability or some esoteric human metric. This means like if I change Java to have lambdas in JDK 8, then textbooks have to be rewritten and all of the students have to buy new textbooks. So just show of hands, how many students have had to buy a new textbook in computer science over the last five years? Okay. How many teachers have used a new textbook within the last five years? Only one. Two. Okay, still. When we alter language products or create new one, it also can cause potentially duplication of effort. So for example, um, in the new C++11 standard, they added a hash table, right? There's nothing wrong with adding a hash table to a language. It's not even particularly that much work. But the point is, they've added one, and that is duplication of effort. We know that because other hash table implementations exist, right? So what's weird, though, is that even though it's obvious that this impact of language wars is doing something to our community, whatever that is, strangely, computer scientists as a whole seem to not investigate the programming language wars. So what that means in this context, or what I mean by that, or really uh, my co-author and I, Stefan Hanneberg in Germany, we mean that in reality, in the real world, we see a, a tremendous number of programming languages in use for many purposes, and we have very little idea about what the impact that has on communities, on people, on individuals, on different types of groups, on blind kids, on students, on professionals, on bioinformaticists, on physicists, on any of these people. We don't, we don't study this very carefully at all. Um, and I think this language wars idea has three ideas at least that are sort of core to what the, the language wars is. One is the, a concept I call language divergence, which means basically that many languages exist and their designs are often incompatible. Now, that doesn't mean to imply that this is necessarily bad, but it does to mean, mean to imply that this is true. We know that this is a fact, right? Language divergence does exist uh, in many ways. Now, second, languages have impact. And interestingly, there are actually quite few scientific experiments uh, that are actually conducted on the impact that programming languages have. For example, again, we don't really know how particular language features might impact someone doing informatics, or we don't particularly know how static typing impacts an eight-year-old or a 12-year-old or a teenager or whatever it is. This actually matters because um, people use programming technologies at all levels. So for example, in the UK, Simon Peyton Jones is setting up a program because in the UK, computer science is becoming required. And when I talk to him, he has questions like, if I have a six-year-old using programming, what should he use and what will the impact be on that particular group? It's an important question because they actually have to teach it to those people. Right? And of course, there's language communities. You know, by, um, in programming languages, we often have groups, like at Java 1, they, have, they teach predominantly Java or JVM languages. There's Python communities, Ruby communities, et cetera. And it's, it's especially weird that we don't investigate the language wars very carefully, in part because as human beings, we actually have natural conflicts of interest with programming language design. So for example, um, Oracle owns Java, right? So by definition, if Oracle claims a particular piece of Java is good or bad, we, don't, we shouldn't necessarily believe them by fiat, right? Because they own it, they're promoting it, right? It's marketing, right? Um, there's people that follow programming languages. You know, maybe you've used it for a while, and so you like it, and so we shouldn't necessarily believe that by fiat either, because there might be just a belief there. Um, there are people that also just believe that things are good or bad in language design. And these beliefs might have evidence and they might not, right? Um, there's also dependence on programming languages. So this would be um, maybe things like Facebook, which wrote uh, Facebook in PHP originally, right? And um, on the one hand, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but Facebook has an automatic dependence on a particular technology by the sheer fact that they're using it, right? Again, this isn't good or bad, it just is the state of the, the industry right now. And finally, hypothetically, we could have people that are truly independent, that are volunteers, although I suspect for programmers this is probably rather rare, 
So I think that it would make sense if we had more objective and data-driven ways for analyzing the impact of language design on these groups or divergence or people or whatever. But oftentimes when I say this publicly, people tell me that I'm trying to promote one of two things. So I want to talk about these things just so that I don't have to hear about them after the talk, hopefully. Um, and one of these I call one language to rule them all, right? And one of these I call unique snowflakes. <laughs> I mention these also in part because I've heard these two claims so many times that I'm just really, really bored of hearing about them, right? So what's one language to rule them all? How many people have heard this term? It's been used many, many times. Okay, one language rule them all implies that you're gonna have one programming language that works for all possible people under all possible conditions. Is one language to rule them all plausible? Probably not, right? That seems unlikely. On the other hand, there's this idea of unique snowflakes, which I've also heard many, many, many times. Unique snowflakes means that every single developer that has ever existed under all possible conditions requires a unique programming language. And the reason is because, right? Which is silly. So I think it's helpful to discuss these to point out that these are both unrealistic and that we need to find shades of gray. So can we get to one language to rule them all? Well, seems unlikely, why? Because humans vary, and that's easy to show in empirical studies that humans vary. Um, problem domains vary, that's obviously true, right? Parsing might be different than writing a program in bioinformatics, right? Problems vary. And even good languages, whatever that means, may not be adopted. So for example, if you made the best programming language ever and you could prove it somehow, which I don't think is possible, um, people might not use it, right? And that's, that's possible. But it brings up questions. For example, which domain-specific languages actually benefit humans? We hear about this all the time, right? Like we hear that um, R is a good language for statistics. How many people have heard that? Wow, a lot of people. Or we might hear that Antler is good for parsing uh, better than others. And we might ask, what language designs help the largest user base possible under the greatest number of circumstances? Are there aspects of language designs that cut across people? So for example, maybe I had a particular language feature that actually does help both 12-year-olds and bioinformatics specialists, or maybe no such features exist. Generally, and unfortunately, we, we don't really study that. So here's a couple more examples. Um, the idea of Antler versus parsing uh, for parsing compared to Java. How many people, again, by a show of hands, would say that Antler is probably easier? How many people would say that Java is probably easier for parsing? Nobody. So two people thought, how many people have no idea? <laughs> okay, wow, okay, wow, that's surprising. Um, so I, I would tend to be in the camp that Antler is probably easier, but I've never seen an experiment, right? Um, what about R? Do you think that R would be e easier for statistics compared to using an equivalent library in Python. How many people would say R would be easier? How many people would say Python would be easier? How many, again, have no idea? Well, there's no answer to that question either, either because we don't, we don't actually study it. We just invent the new languages, right? Um, now, what about uh, in, how many people played World of Warcraft? Seriously? <laughs> I thought this was the computer science department. There's like six hands, wow. They're not gonna admit it. I've written scripts in so many MMOs, anyway. Um, I used to automate Star Wars Galaxies, which is a terrible game, but whatever. Um, so like we rewrote scripts and then we came back a few months later and we were all Jedi, anyway. Um, so in World of Warcraft, not that you would know, um, they use a programming language called Lua, which interfaces with game libraries in a certain way. And Lua was is used basically as a scripting utility for playing the game or parts of the game. How many people would say that Lua was a better choice than using C++, all else being equal, if they both went into that? Who would say Lua? How many people would say C++? Yeah, again, we have no idea because we don't generally study how languages or parts of languages or features of languages impact human beings, right, at various levels. And even if we can guess these things, our guesses don't really matter. Because what we really want is scientific measurements where we can determine the size of the effect and the direction, right? Like this one is better by this much, right? Under these conditions. 
So OK, so you might say, OK, that's fine. I buy the argument that maybe one language to rule them all is implausible, but I still believe that we're all just unique snowflakes. Well, unfortunately, evidence from the scientific literature shows that this view is actually scientifically unlikely. Right? So um, we measure standard deviation on programmers. And if we were to measure this and it was so high that no systematic measurements were meaningful, then we might say plausible. Or even if it was the case that all the studies that exist on this are currently wrong, if you wanted to believe unique snowflakes, you would have to actually show systematically that um, having a unique language for all developers under all conditions would somehow improve productivity for the organization as a whole, which seems like a hard study to run and totally unlikely. So anyway, the point here is this view is probably just wrong, right? So let's, let's talk about it. So why? Well, it turns out that we actually know a few things because we've been running experiments. My lab uh, run, ran many of these, but um, there's, there's many more. Um, so for example, how many people know what static typing means? OK, good. Um, well, it turns out that Static typing, we now have pretty strong evidence that it improves productivity under a wide variety of conditions. There are many randomized controlled trials now, and they all seem to point in the same direction. Now, there are caveats. There are details with generics and stuff like that. And if you want to know exactly how that impacts people, then you can ask me. But nonetheless, overall and generally speaking, uh, static typing tends to improve productivity. And I'll show you some graphs in a second. Uh, how many people have used threads in concurrency? It turns out that sucks. Um, specifically, it turns out if you use software transactional memory, I actually didn't run this one. This was done by uh, Chris Rossback out of, I think, UT Austin when he did this. Um, and they found that if you use software transactional memory, you get eight-fold less bugs. Eight-fold less bugs. So we're still at such an infancy as a discipline that we can find effects at eight orders of magnitude. Holy crap. That's huge. In psychology, you might see tiny little effects because lots of things have been already studied. And of course, um, one of the studies my lab did do is we ran um, an experiment comparing how programming languages are represented, like the types of symbols and that sort of stuff. And we found we, when we do these studies, we always compare to what we call language placebo, right? You know the concept of placebo? You know, this is like sugar pills, that sort of stuff. Well. Nobody really knows what a sugar pill would be for programming languages. So what we did is we sat around our lab and we rolled dice, right? So we rolled dice, and then that was the programming language, whatever the dice said, basically. You know, computer dice, like random number generators. And then all the symbols were chosen randomly from the ASCII table. It's a great language. Um, and it turns out that some languages have syntax that's so poorly chosen that it does no better in controlled tests than our randomly chosen language, specifically Perl and Java. <laughs> and by the way, when the first result came out, it was posted all over Slashdot for whatever reason. I think the top comment was something like, but wait, isn't Perl a randomly chosen language? But, but anyway, um, but it turns out Java actually does just slightly worse than Perl, surprisingly. Yeah, that's actually, I, that's twice now. Um, that surprised me a lot because uh, I wouldn't have expected that. But it turns out that the type annotations, the little word int inside those method declarations, makes a big difference to people for some reason. OK, so let's look at some actual data so you don't have to just take my word for it. So if you look at this paper on the left on your screen, this is from ICSI. And it's a little bit hard to see on the bottom, but we've got on the leftmost graph, that's static typing if you have documentation on the method. On the second to the left, that's static typing with no documentation. Notice how much it increases the variance for developers. That's fascinating to me. Uh, time, yes. Higher is worse. It takes more time. This is the amount of time it takes to write a um, correct program that passes 100% of a set of test cases, basically. Um, if you look on the right-hand side of the graph, the left on the right would be dynamic typing with documentation. And on the very right, it's dynamic typing with no documentation. So basically, what this shows, if you look at the effect size for studies like this one or this one, you see that static typing has an effect size of about 0.3 to 0.5. So what that means is that you see, if you see wobble amongst developers, like variation amongst them, it explains between somewhere around 30 to 50% of the variance, which is quite a bit, actually. 
So it has quite a lot of explanatory power. Um, and if you look in the, the graph on the right, this is again a static versus dynamic study. It's a lot different for a lot of reasons, but at the end of the day, the result is relatively similar. Static typing, generally speaking, helps your productivity with some exceptions. And those are talked about in the paper. All right, so here's an example of a graph from one of the syntax studies. Oh, did you have a question? Yes, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what was the task you were having programmers complete? Oh, OK. There's a lot of different tasks, so you want to look at the paper. There are all the stuff's in there. So, so it's a pretty broad range. Uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, we when, and this is just two studies. We have a bunch more of them. And every time we do one, we try to come up with tasks that will benefit one group or the other. So I know my friend in Germany right now is trying to come up with tasks where dynamic typing will win, just so we, we can document whether there are cases that exist. And it wins at passing 100% of a test week. Uh, in a smaller amount of time, yeah. So it's a productivity measure. It's not the only way that you can run a study. You can also do things like an accuracy study, which is the next slide, which means you have a fixed time and how well can you do in that time. So there are different views. I mean, what you want is that if you run it in a many different ways that you get the same answer. That's mostly what we're seeing. So that's, that's good. So, I don't know, does that answer your question? OK, thanks. All right, so here's the, um, the study on syntax that I just mentioned about that had Perl and Java in it. It also had Python. Uh, uh, Quorum, uh, Perl, and Randomo, and Ruby. Uh, so for example, I've heard that some people are sort of pushing Python right now as sort of a, an intro language, and there's nothing wrong with that. It does okay in these studies, but like many languages, it gets many pieces wrong, and I don't suspect many people in the computer science community know which pieces are when, unless they read the papers. Though actually, I don't think the Python data is out there completely. But anyway. Um, so, as part of these studies, one of the benefits of doing an analysis like this very rigorously is not just doing a raw comparison across languages, it's that you can actually break down the tasks into what we call token accuracy maps. So, do you see the little red, red squiggles in this data? Yes? Red outline? Okay. Yeah. So, these red outlines are tokens, and it's hard to see, but if you look at the top left corner, there's a word integer, and then 0.5, and then 0.42. That means in the first replication that we ran, 50% of people got that particular token correct. In the second replication, which was done on double the sample size, 42% of people got that token correct. Now, what's interesting about this is that if you do a sufficiently large number of tasks under a sufficiently large number of conditions, you can start to see commonalities as to which tokens cause people problems, right? And the nice thing is, this replicates very strongly. If you look at the data and you run it again, you get effectively the same answer again. Get the idea? OK, so studies aside, we might ask ourselves, well, why would I even care? Because I get that there's maybe small variations in syntax. I get that maybe static typing might be a little bit better, but why does that even matter? Well, it turns out that the actual industry or education is doing weird things in our discipline. So for example, we looked at 39 universities in the Midwest, and of these we saw that they were using C, C++, Alice, VB, Python, Java, C Sharp, COBOL, and ADA in just the first course. Now, which parts of these languages had a positive impact on people? Which parts had a negative impact? What's the evidence for or against those beliefs? The answer is there's almost none in the literature. It's a gaping hole in the literature, a gaping hole in the literature. And so far as we could tell from actually talking to scholars that use these, oftentimes, I think, people use languages for many reasons, historical reasons. They use languages because maybe there's something you know, in the area that, that prompts them to use it. Like I, I would be unsurprised if I learned that you guys use C Sharp for stuff. Is that correct? Not at all? Hey, cool, interesting. Um, but anyway, the point is, the reasons are not totally clear. So for example, when I was talking to the person that used ADA, I felt as if they were a little bit defensive, perhaps, on why they used ADA. When the reality is, I don't care whether, what people use, but it's interesting that we make certain choices like this. Anyway, the lesson really is the scholars seem to do just whatever the hell they want. Right? So we might have questions. So one question I have is, what is the total cost throughout history of developing all computer programming languages, supporting libraries, and tools? How much does that cost, and how much will it continue to cost? 
if language designers created languages with an increasingly larger evidence base over the next century, what would that impact be? Right? So if we started running very controlled experiments and we had a century, where could we get to? Maybe not one language to rule them all, but where? Of the time used in developing programming languages, what percentage was spent reinventing the same solution? So I gave one example of the use of a hash map in C++, but that's a rather trivial example. But how much replication exists across the industry as a whole, and how much money has that cost? Right? And, and also, what's the total historical productivity lost by switching or updating programming languages in various settings? So how much does it cost the military? How much does it cost academic institutions? How much does it cost various kinds of industries? Which ones, et cetera? And interestingly, we might say, now, I get that. I get that maybe there's these different types of language features that might be impacting people. And I get that maybe people are just doing whatever they want, but surely the language design communities have studied this systematically. Surely that is true. And it turns out that is also not true. Specifically, as most of us know, language designers do study very rigorously the mathematical properties of programming languages. That's clear if you read any papers from Popol, ICFP, or these other languages, right? And it, all, it also makes sense, of course, because we want our languages to be efficient and we want them to work correctly, right? That's abundantly clear. However, beyond just proofs of correctness or just efficiency tests, we generally do not investigate other things. At least it's rare, right? For example, a mathematical proof won't tell us anything about how a programming language impacts first-year novices, because it doesn't imply a measurement. Nor will it tell us how that impacts fourth-year professionals at Google. Not first year, not second year, maybe fourth year is different. We wouldn't know, right? And obviously, mathematical proofs are the gold standard, but they only apply to some situations for the same reason that physicists decided to build the Large Hadron Collider, right? They didn't build it for fun. They built it to check assumptions about the mathematics, to see if that nature actually held the properties that mathematicians thought it might, right? And so when we look at the actual evidence from papers, it turns out that so far we've been looking very carefully to document whether or not this evidence gathering is happening. So far we've only been able to read about 2,200 papers from the language communities. Um, this is a graph from uh, a particular set of conferences that claim to have data about uh, the impact on humans. And it turns out even amongst these, it's exceedingly rare. So for example, the um, Psychology of Programming Interest Group, which is supposedly dedicated to this stuff, only somewhere around 1% of papers had actual controlled trials, like actually scientific, right? That you can replicate and do all this sort of stuff. Um, some venues are better, like for example, there's one called Empirical Studies on Programmers, which may in fact be the best resource ever on this stuff and it's almost completely unknown in our field. How many people have even heard of it, empirical studies on programmers? One person, awesome. <laughs> so anyway, out of 2,200 papers, basically what we found at the major conferences like UPSA or ICFP, we find that it's, the situation is in fact quite worse. So if I recall the data correctly, at ICFP, of their entire history, literally every single paper they have ever written, ever, we've only found two where they collected evidence. Ouch, from my perspective. But functional programming is good, right? We don't know. So anyway, evidence gathering needs to be part of our scholarly culture, right? We shouldn't just believe things. It needs to be part of our scholarly culture. And so one question I have is, how can we increase the programming language design community's evidence standards? How can we take a community and convince them to gather evidence? How do we do that? That's not an easy question. And can we create a catalog using something like the DSM? Is anyone familiar with the DSM? Oh, good. Um, well, the DSM is not a perfect analogy by any stretch of the imagination. But nonetheless, there are, there are techniques in other disciplines where they try to handle details like replication or these sort of things. We need that in our discipline, desperately. We need to be able to, if you don't believe one of the studies on static typing, you very much so should be able to go to a website, download the replication packet, and run it for yourself and try to refute it. That should be totally normal, right? It's not, 
So we also have responsibilities. So one of these is that if you make a claim that you think has an impact on communities or people or whatever, you should provide evidence of that. So let's take a short detour to aspect-oriented programming. How many people have heard of aspect-oriented programming? Okay. So it's interesting stuff. So far as I know, the first paper came out in around 1997. Um, the results from the idea seemed genuinely appealing to a lot of people, enough so that a conference was established, although they changed the name recently. But, um, and I can think of examples where this idea of cross-cutting concerns, sort of something that is a sort of a different modularity technique, might matter. So, and also, aspect-oriented programming came from like a background in language design, meta-object protocols, compiler construction. It wasn't like this popped out of the ground, right? But was there actual evidence that cross-cutting concerns mattered or that aspect-oriented programming actually helped you, right? Because that was the claim, effectively. And so the second responsibility is that you should provide evidence that a solution actually helps. And in the case of AOP, it turns out that it really doesn't help, right? There is a caveat when you have specifically tasks like logging, which was the examples most often used by people like Gonzales, you do see small effects for AOP, but they're very small. On the other hand, when you look at almost any other kind of tasks, you see that there's effectively no impact or a negative potential impact of aspect-oriented programming. In other words, while that's all well and good, those experiments didn't happen until almost a decade after that happened, right, after this was created. That's interesting because by that point, we'd established academic conferences, people were getting tenure or not based on the theories, all sorts of stuff until we ran one experiment to actually test our assumptions. The next responsibility is that if it isn't broken, leave it alone. So for example, um, take something like Java. Now, in Java, in JDK 5, they, asked, they added a feature called generics. If you don't know generics, well, actually, do you know generics? Oh, good, I won't explain. Um, say it anyway? Okay. Well, generics is basically a way that you can add on some extra information to the static type system that makes it easier, potentially, to use something like collections, right? So you can have a list, and you only have integers in it. That's the idea, right? Now, actually, generics are much more complicated than that, because there's many, many things you can do with it. Uh, but nonetheless, that's the basic idea. Now, I'm not saying generics are good or bad. If you want to know more information about that, there is one controlled trial, which was Uppsala 2013, if you want to know. Uh, the answer is that those little things that you use, like list with an int, gives you a slight productivity boost. But if you have to change a generic class, it gives you a tenfold decrease in productivity, which is sort of interesting. Um, but anyway, that was added into Java JDK 5. But that's interesting because also in JDK 5, they changed a whole bunch of other things, right? So what was the evidence on any of those features? I don't think there was any. Um, what about JDK 8? So JDK 8 just came out. And to my knowledge, I don't know of any experiments at all that are um, uh, influencing the design of a language that has worldwide impact on potentially millions of people. Right? I think Oracle's claim is that Java's on 3 billion devices. If we're going to put a new version on 3 billion devices, it seems logical to me to investigate whether those features matter. Right? So we might ask, what's the impact on professionals? What's the impact on students? How much will it cost to change or purchase all new textbooks? Whatever. Those seem like reasonable questions we should ask. And interestingly, um, there's, a new, there's another language called Boo. Has anyone used Boo? Nobody. Oh, one. OK. So Boo's interesting. In the, in the Boo manifesto, the sheer fact that it comes from a manifesto should be telling. But the Boo creator says, sometimes it's appropriate to give up the safety net provided by static typing. Maybe you just want to explore an API without worrying too much about method signatures. Or maybe you're creating code that talks to external components, such as com objects. Either way, the choice is yours, not mine. Now, it's just fine for someone to make a claim. I mean, hypotheses are sort of what we do as scientists. But at the end of the day, this is refuted by evidence. And we need to gather more of it so we can detect these things. And interestingly, is the Boo author really doing anything different than all the authors at these language conferences? The answer is not really. He may or may not have proofs. But he's not really investigating how those things impact the actual communities or people or students or whatever. So this might have uh, other questions or responsibilities. 
One might be, we need to investigate whether language features impact humans in practice, and we should investigate the divergence of languages and figure out how that's impacting uh, the world. And I think another issue we need to think about is that we need to disseminate verifiable claims about language design. And this needs to happen in educational settings. So for example, while it's all fine and good to conduct empirical studies, unless developers in industry, oftentimes which are the ones that make these decisions, actually know what these things are, it will have no impact. So for example, in the next version of Java, JDK 9, if the developers of that particular tool are not familiar with the evidence on programming languages or aren't gathering any, then nothing will change. We need to disseminate verifiable claims to large audiences, right? Which is one reason why I'm here. Um, I think the following activities might be helpful. So I think we need more outreach with industry partners, telling them about evidence and confronting people about these decisions. Um, I think we should have empirical studies before we implement new versions and put them worldwide to billions of devices. I think um, we need more outreach with individual developers so they can differentiate between data-oriented investigations and marketing, right? There's a big difference between a randomized controlled trial and a marketing claim, right? And we need to do more outreach at conferences and with students on what we actually know about uh, in terms of the human and social impact on language design. So one thing I always, I always like to ask here is if I'm at a school um, it's often, you would think that people are often familiar with the scientific method. So let me ask, how many people here have ever run or studied how to do randomized controlled trials? How many people have studied why we use randomized controlled trials over other procedures in science? How many people have studied the history of randomized controlled trials? Do you know where they come from or what mistakes were made? Yeah. I mean, it sounds like this audience is, oh, has a much higher proportion than many that I talk to, but nonetheless, um, it's something that needs to happen more at universities, I think. But I think that it's not just all on academics, because academics can't magically fix the language wars. There's no, there's no silver bullet, so to, so, so to speak. The software industry needs to tell us more information, and part of this, I think, is getting rid of some of these half pseudo y ish type metrics, like the Tyobe Index. Now, if you're unfamiliar with it, it's sort of a methodologically weak to try to get a rough guess as to what languages are used. Now, I'm not an expert on, on Tyobe or Tiobe or however it's pronounced, but nonetheless, we do actually need to know more information about what software, the software industry, industry is using, because if we had that information, it would guide what experiments and things we should actually run. So while, while Tiobe or Tyobe um, may not be the best measure, on the other hand, we need more information from software professionals if we're going to make experiments that are meaningful to industry or various groups. And language changes that come out of big venues need to have evidence. So for example, uh, my university happens to use C++, which just changed to the C++11 standard. Um, there were quite a few syntax changes. They added the use of lambdas. Uh, there's now certain kinds of type inference. There's explicit overrides, constructor delegation, generalized constant expressions, move constructors. But so far as I can tell, in the thousand page or more specification of C++11, the word usability only shows up one time, and it was most definitely not in the context of the humans that will actually use it. That's weird. That's generally not something we should see happen. This is something that needs investigation before we put a standard into worldwide adoption and practice at all universities that use it, any industry group that uses it, et cetera. And educational institutions, besides just scholars, just you know, teachers, et cetera, we have some, uh, some things we need to do too. Um, so educational students probably, institutions probably have one of the broadest impact on the next generation of programmers. And I think that um, they're gonna need to use this responsibility to get the evidence standards higher over time. Uh, so specifically, I think that um, these institutions have at least two Number one is they need to analyze the impact of language designs on everyone, including students. So for example, um, as I'll t well, it shouldn't just be about professionals. We need to talk about everyone with this problem. We need to know how six-year-olds use it, how 12-year-olds use it, et cetera. And we need to actually teach empirical methods to programming language students, not just because, not just because empirical methods are good, but because we need students to better understand how to differentiate between things like randomized controlled trials and marketing, right? Students need to have those skills. 
They need to know the difference between scientific methods and beliefs. And so, as I mentioned on the last slide, I think this is important that we need to analyze the language impact on everyone. So, for example, whenever I run a study, it's inevitable that someone will tell me, hey, I like this study, but you tested here with group X, and I'm convinced without evidence that group Y would give different results. Now, of course, oftentimes that's actually true. Group Y may very well give different results. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad to study group X or Y. So, for example, I've heard many times, if I do a study with students, that we should have actually tested professionals because those are the only people that matter. I've heard other times when we test with older groups, this doesn't matter because it's students that are the only ones that matter, right? Or uh, at another talk that I was at in London recently, someone said, the only group that matters are developers on large projects that are running with a million lines of code or more. Because, right? Because that's the group that matters. With students, we need more studies in part because students are impacted by this, uh, obviously. The data that we have shows clear evidence that students are impacted, so we need to know more about that, especially if we're going to make these decisions like what languages are used in the classroom and how can we make them better. And we could realistically test anyone on the spectrum. So one thing that I like to get past is that it's not about novices or professionals, right? We could hypothetically test anyone between ages zero and death, right? Before zero is hard, and after death would be a very morbid study, right? Now, realistically, we might shrink that range, like people that haven't retired in computer science or, you know, people that can read, right, that are old enough to read. But the point is that these many kinds of people are impacted by the technologies that we create, but we don't know almost anything about how they use them or what the impact is. And so I usually like to end with this sort of stuff. So if you look at this slide really quick, and I want you to answer which of these claims are based on actual scientific evidence that can be replicated by other scientists. So for example, ACA says we're going to build powerful concurrent and distributed applications more easily. Is that claim based on evidence or not? Or Python has claims. Perl is apparently flexible and powerful, which, which might be true but it's not tested. Haskell, Racket, Scratch, who's Scratch good for? Under what conditions? Compared to what, right? And students might actually benefit from changes to principles of programming courses. So for example, in a principles of programming course right now, oftentimes what we do is we give students a survey of what exists. But what we tend not to do is to try to figure out whether that matters, right? Like, um, we might choose a language in a principal programming course, like I'm going to give them a functional one or an OOP one. I've done it myself, of course. But what we don't teach them is how to investigate claims. We have many of them, but we don't teach them anything about investigating things with this, right? I think this is part of the problem. And students need to know evidence-based arguments. So for example, when a book talks about th the differences between static and dynamic typing, that book should also mention the actual evidence on the issues. Now, that evidence is ultimately going to be imperfect using empirical methods for the same reason that people die still during heart surgery, right? Nothing's perfect. But at the same time, if we don't put that evidence into the textbooks and make sure that it's actually discussed, students will be still with this unfortunate problem of having only marketing to go by. So at the end of the day, my point is that we need to think more deeply about the programming language wars before we leave a mess for the next generation to clean up. The reasons are because we duplicate effort massively, we reinvent the wheel constantly, we deploy features worldwide without a shred of evidence on its impact on almost anyone, at almost any level, at almost any organization. Some parts of what we create might be helping, and other parts might be doing harm, but we really have no idea which ones or when. We need to take action on this because it's probably expensive, and it's probably hurting the industry overall in a negative fashion. But the nice thing is, is that throughout history, every mystery that's ever been solved has turned out to be not magic. And by using actual scientific procedures, we might be able to make at least some progress over the next century or so. So no matter what you thought about this talk, I hope that at least made you think a smidge or so. And I'll leave off with a pointless marketing plug. And that is, if you're interested in Quorum, check it out. That's it.
Questions? Any evidence that evidence-based approaches to programming language design produce better programming languages? Ah, that's a great question. So the question is, do you have any evidence that evidence-based approaches to programming languages uh, have a positive impact? So the answer is a tricky one in science, because actually there's a long history of people asking this same question, but for many other fields. So for example, if you look at the history of randomized controlled trials, you know where they came from? You ever seen the first one? It was actually, believe it or not, so far as I understand it, the first one to use sort of a metaphorical placebo. Uh, there's this great paper by this guy named Kapchuk, and it was in the late 1700s. It turns out Louis XIV, like the king dude, right? Um, he hired Benjamin Franklin to investigate this claim called mesmerism. Are you familiar? Have you ever heard of this, mesmerism? It's like BS pseudoscience, right? It's like, at the time, imagine, imagine that you're living in the late 1700s, and people are telling you things like, there's gravity, man, and it's this like invisible force, man, and um, that it's controlling the universe, man, right? And the funny thing is, is that mesmerists, or Anton Mesmer, which is why we use the word mesmerize nowadays, it means you're fooled, right? Um, he was arguing that he could heal people, right? And he would heal you through the healing fluid. So if Richard's knee goes out, I would, sorry, I would use the healing fluid and he would be healed, right? So it turns out, Benjamin Franklin said, what? Because he was a scientist. And so he came up with all sorts of clever ways to test this assumption, right? So one of them was, uh, if I recall, this is off the top of my head, so read the paper, but whatever. Um, he would put people like mesmerists in a closet and have a person on a bed or something, and then he'd drop scissors, and then the person would use the healing fluid to heal them. And of course, guess what happened? Nothing, right? But if the mesmerist was in the room or something like that, guess what happened? The placebo effect, right? So here's the thing. That's one example. In medicine, though, even though they had controlled experiments showing clear evidence that that was a BS theory, mesmerism lasted for a century in medicine, right? So it also turns out, if you look at the early 1800s, like the work of Heinemann on uh, homeopathy, you know, homeopathy, Sort of like, I give you water and then you're magically healed. Actually, it wasn't quite that at first. It was very dangerous and it involved these like rituals and other ridiculous things, but whatever. So even though I think, if I recall correctly, that came out around the early 1830s or so, the first trial where they used sort of a mock placebo-ish type idea, it wasn't quite the same at the time, it was the early 1900s. So almost 70 years after that happened. But the thing is, is that those claims were utter bunk. And in medicine, what we found is that when people were not using evidence, it was essentially a snake oil salesman's dream because they could say effectively whatever they wanted and there would be no one to check. So in Capture, he says this claim that I, I, I will never forget. It's so wonderful. I, I'm going to say it slightly wrong, but it, it's something like a doctor from around that period, and he said something around the range of, there's no way I'm going to test Heinemann's beliefs on homeopathy because it's clear that bloodletting is the right approach to medicine. So my argument isn't so much that I can prove in any systematic sense that evidence gathering will be helpful for a particular domain like programming languages or rocketry or bioinformatics or whatever. My point is that over the last few centuries, the enlightenment and science has actually worked. And I would be very surprised if science was somehow immune to this particular discipline. It's the best I can do. Yes? So if I'm creating my new dependently typed system extension X, how do I even find people to, to try this and see how good they are? And secondly, like, won't there be a discrepancy? Because some people already know the old system, and it you know, they don't know yet how to use the new system and so on, and they'll definitely be versed with it? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the question is basically that if I have a particular problem that I'm, I'm working on, maybe, what do you say, dependent typing or something? Yeah. yeah, but choose whatever one that you want. Isn't there potential biases with different kinds of users? How do I get the people to investigate? This is a great question, and the reason it's a great question is because this is actually hard, right? And it's, it's actually not unique to our discipline either. Like, for example, um, if I was doing a controlled study in medicine, I can't give half of you cancer and not give half of you not, right? I can't do that. And in programming, we have 
we have inevitable problems. Like, for example, if I wanted to do a study comparing Python and Java, that's, that's a one that you might think is really simple to do. That's actually really hard. Because if I'm, teach, if I'm testing that, who am I testing with, right? Am I testing people that have had a year of Java and no Python? Because that's unfair, right? So the answer is this. The answer is you have to work really hard and try to figure out how to make your experiment fair. And that there's no easy like one-liner that I can give you that will tell you the right answer for your particular kind of experiment. But usually what we do in our lab is we run a large set of pilot studies on various kinds of configurations in the experiment. And then slowly over time, we run all of them. Because it's the only way we know how right now. So for example, with static typing, the first experiments that were done on this just compared, here's a group with static typing and here's without. And then we said, well, but wait a minute. We tried it with no documentation, but does that actually matter? So we added documentation or not. But we then tried it in a non-IDE, so like a text editor. But does that matter? It turns out it doesn't. Um, but if you have a text editor or not, well, then you need to know that too. So the point is, in science, oftentimes we have to test a wide plethora of uh, configurations to know whether a study generalizes beyond the context we originally tested in. That's a hard question to answer. Now for the second one, where do you get the people? Um, that is somewhat of the benefit of being a professor, is that it's not very hard for me to get people. But as a student, I imagine that it probably is. So just to give you a story that I told somebody else earlier, um, when I was a graduate student, I was trying to do studies related to my work on blindness, right? But I had no one to test with, because you can't just like call up blind programmers are us and like grab 150 blind programmers and run a test. So I convinced another university to let me run a study on all of their students, even though they weren't actually blind, but I wanted some kind of data as a proxy to begin with before I tested with actual blind people, which I do all the time now. So the point was, I had to go to pretty great lengths just to even do this. But other disciplines have mechanisms. So in psychology, does anyone know what it's called? It's called a participant pool. And those are really easy to set up and really easy to get past IRB boards, and they work very well. They're not perfect, but it's a start. So, so that's not a great answer. That's the best I can probably do, but I hope that gives you a little bit of insight. Any more questions? Yeah. Zach. Uh, so at the beginning of the talk, you mentioned how many fields are now turning to computer science to provide the tools they need to solve their research challenges. But the problems you pointed out here are not problems that we traditionally have strong tools to solve. So why don't we pull in psychologists and sociologists and people who do this kind of work to help us solve these problems? Or is there a reason that they're not well suited to it? Or I don't know. Uh, no, actually, I think that's probably spot on. I think that, you know, when, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I keep re <laughs> The person that had the camera even said I would forget probably to restate the question. And that's what I did on every question. So, um, so the question is, as computer scientists, we often don't have training in how to do these things. Um, so why don't we just get psychologists and sociologists to help us? And I say, hell yeah, absolutely. In fact, take a guess what we do, <laughs> right? So when, when I started doing this stuff, uh, I had no clue in China how to run a randomized controlled trial. So I spent years in uh, the office of uh, my, one of my co-chairs on my committee, Bob Patterson, who is a clinical uh, psychologist, uh, sorry, an experimental psychologist. And he just had me doing every kind of experiment under the sun. I would give him experiments back once a week, little pilot tests that I run. And every single time, it would be the same thing. He would look at it for half a second and say, no, this is crap. Rerun it. And then that happened for like a year or two. Until eventually, I figured out how to do it. And I didn't need the psychologist anymore because I've just done it so much. But um, I know this is true with my colleague Stefan Hannenberg as well. He spent years now talking to psychologists and figuring this stuff out before he got comfortable with how to do this. And it would be nice if we didn't have to, because it was just part of our classes that you take as a computer scientist. But generally, right now, if you don't know how to do it, you almost have no choice. You have to bring in other people and collaborate with them on, on what to do, because it's, it's too hard otherwise. Randomized controlled trials are not easy. I mean, they're very complicated. So does that help? OK. OK. Well, thank you very much, Andy, for a great talk.